In the spring of 1979, San Francisco 49ers new head coach, Bill Walsh, placed a phone call to Clemson quarterback, Steve Fuller. Fuller's roommate, Dwight Clark, answered the phone. From that day forward, the lives of Walsh, Clark, and the 49er franchise would never be the same. It is a pivotal day, and, and the interesting thing about that is I had my golf clubs on my shoulder, and I was heading out the door when the phone rang, and I went back and picked it up, and it was Bill Walsh. Quarterback Fuller again. Bill was coming in to try out Steve Fuller. We talked for a little bit, and he said, well, I need a receiver to run some routes. Could you come and run some routes for me since I'm here to try out your roomie? So I, of course, said yes. Just had one of those very fortunate days where I caught everything. So he asked me to stay after the workout, and then he asked me if we could watch tape. And, you know, I, I said, you know, I only, I only caught 11 passes. And, and he said, well, is there any game where you caught two passes? And I said, yeah, against North Carolina, I caught two passes. One was across the middle, way up high. And Fuller, throwing over the middle to Dwight Clark, he makes a spectacular catch. He was fairly impressed with that, so that was my Bill Walsh tryout. Dwight looked good to me, and I know he didn't look necessarily good to many other scouts. And as the, grass, the, excuse me, as the draft progressed, Many of our scouts said, you can coach, you can get him in the free agent market a month from now. And I said, no, that man is going to be here. You watch. And so we drafted him. Dwight Clark, tall, skinny, couldn't really run real fast, could catch real good. Obviously was a chick magnet. <laughs> I'm Sean Weddle and I'm Miss University. And my three favorite football players are Dwight Clark from the San Francisco 49ers. Dwight Clark and Dwight Clark. Football wasn't the first thing that came to mind. You saw him and Joe, and they both look like basketball players. Joe was rookie quarterback Joe Montana, who spent most of his first season as Steve DeBerg's backup. The arrival of Clark, Montana, and Walsh in 79 didn't have an immediate impact. In fact, it took Walsh nearly the entire season to equal the win total of two from the previous year. The 15th week of the season, we played Tampa Bay. We won the game. It was our second win of the year. The players picked Bill up and carried him off the field, and the fans stormed Candlestick Park and tore down the goalposts. And there's enough noise in that stadium at that point, and there's enough cheering that you really can't hear the rest of the country laughing at you when you're tearing down goalposts in your second win of the year and carrying your coach off the field. In my opinion, it was, it was celebrating what was getting ready to happen, what was around the corner, because we had a lot of success that year. We just didn't win a lot of games. We all knew it was just a matter of time before Bill got us where we wanted to go. I don't think anybody can go into the stadium against us and feel safe with a victory. By 1980, Bill Walsh's 49ers were putting fans in the stands and points on the board. Montana throwing to Solomon. He got it. Touchdown, San Francisco. The problem was his ever-changing secondary couldn't keep opponents out of the end zone. We went through like 30-something defensive backs. I mean, they, they quit writing the guys' names on their helmets, you know, with the, the white adhesive tape with the, the name across the front. They stopped it because it wasn't worth the time. It wasn't worth the waste of tape because the guys, they wouldn't make it to lunch. I guess at some point, Bill Walsh just said, I've had enough, and he decided he was going to get his secondary all at once. In the first round, he took Ronnie Lott. From USC, Ronnie in the second round, he took Eric Wright. From Missouri, Eric Wright. And in the third round, he took Carlton Williamson. From Dwight Hicks was the veteran of that group. He had been cut by a few teams, was working in a health food store, and got another break. I'm sure there were some veterans that were saying, what the hell is he doing? We're drafting these guys, he's just gonna stick them in there. You know, we're throwing away this year. Pull it down, catch in the air and then rebound. George Seifert's a defensive back coach, and it's his mission. Go up in the air, Ron. That these guys are gonna know what they're doing. <laughs> Here we go, Carlton. Get up in the air now. They'd be in the meeting rooms longer than anybody else. They'd get there before everybody else, and they'd leave after everybody else. We were going to kidnap George, and we were going to 
you know, take them and try to <laughs> bury them. I need to train you guys. I need to get you guys in shape. We would go on long trips running through the streets. Can you imagine an NFL team running through the st streets of their community getting in shape? That's what we were doing with George Seifert. That's what he said. I'm working with you guys step by step. Another key to the developing secondary was Sievert's new assistant, former 49er defensive back Ray Rhodes. Ray Rhodes, then and to this day, has a defensive swagger and attitude that those four, specifically those four young guys, fed off. Having Ray Rhodes and having George Seifert, having Cornell University, which George Seifert was the head coach, and having the NFL University. <laughs> What we got is a combination of street and a combination of academia. Ray would say, I want everybody in the stands to go woo. So well, what do you mean by that? He goes, everybody stands up when they see woo. I said, well, what? You got to give a woo lick. Let's hit them like we always do. Let's fly at them, baby. Ready? No turning back. Boom. All of a sudden, we came up with a new term, woo lick. Can you imagine? That was, that's not at Cornell University. The first game of the year was in Pontiac, where the Super Bowl was going to be that year. I remember the first game of the year, you're playing against Billy Sims, <laughs> and you're trying to figure out a way to stop him. And we lose, but, you know, there was a good side to that, because we figured it'd be one of the few times we get to play in a Super Bowl venue. That first month, of that 81 season was like every other year. It really was. When we lost to Atlanta, no one talked about losing. Everybody talked about how we got punched in the mouth. Bill Wall said to us, I never want to see us get out hit like that again. It was about testing your will, testing your manhood. And I can assure you that from that moment on, for the rest of my career and for the years that Bill Walsh was a head coach with the 49ers, we did not get out hit. We remind ourselves what the game is all about. When we take the and feel it's not our brotherhood that's going to do it for us, that we're a machine and we just knock the hell out of people. Nobody, I mean nobody, is going to out hit us. Nobody's going to punch us in the face. Our young defensive backs, we thought our experience was a plus. Our experience was a liability because we had the baggage. They didn't have any baggage. Those guys brought in this college enthusiasm, especially Ronnie Lott, that was just addicting. What are people saying we're going to finish last? No, 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 no. We win. We win. Going into Washington, we were two and two. We're going to play a Washington Redskins team that hasn't won a game. They've got a new coach. We know how that feels. They got some guy named Joe Gibbs coaching them. We actually kicked their butt, and it all started with a crushing Ronnie Lott hit. Ball popped up in the air, and Dwight Hicks takes it and runs about 80 yards. That Washington win was a huge confidence boost. The defense played great. There were huge hits. They were big interceptions. We're now above 500. I mean, that doesn't sound much to normal people, but the guys that have lost game after game after game after game, especially on the road, it's pretty special. You could see that there was something percolating. It was that momentum of what a great startup has in terms of a great company. In the Bay Area, all we talk about is startups. I mean, everybody talked about Apple, and they talked about Intel, and you talk about the Valley, but here, we were the, probably the original startup. Bill Walsh knew his inexperienced secondary would need some veteran leadership. So in 1981, he brought in 11-year pro Jack Hacksaw Reynolds to anchor the defense. 
me, Jack Reynolds is Pete Rose. He's totally dedicated, unbelievably dedicated to football. It's his whole life. So excited about having him on the team when he first got there because, you know, we needed some veteran leadership over there on defense. And, and then after being around him for a while, just thinking, this guy is whacked. Used to be the ad for RCA where the dog's kind of sitting there looking at the speaker going, huh? <laughs> we, we got hacks off from the Rams. It was, huh? <laughs> he's bringing that guy up here? He's a nut. Lived above uh, an auto maintenance store. On game day, he would put his uniform on in his room. Came to breakfast, eye black, hands taped up, ready to play football. I guess he was not the most talented, gifted athlete, but he was brilliant when it came to recognizing what was getting ready to happen. And it was all about preparation. And he would grind that and pound that into the heads of those young guys. We're getting together and working together and uh, we're coming together as a group. I think that's what's helping us. <laughs> you, you know how practically raised that Ronnie Lott, huh? Oh, is that right? What a sweetheart. Oh, my Dad God. Good what a man. What a man. He's a great, great young person. Good kid. Yeah. A great player. He'll make all pro this year if we keep going. You know, maybe halfway through that season, he started saying some things in the locker room and and I think he felt like he could because he was making plays on the field. And it is intercepted, taken away by Ronnie Lott. Veterans will listen to guys, even if they're rookies, if they're getting it done on the field. We're playing the Falcons in week 10. And of course, before the game, you you know say, say a prayer. People seem to be milling about a little bit, getting their helmet or their, you know, just not moving quickly with the purpose. So Ronnie Lott just goes berserk. And he kind of preempts the Lord's Prayer with Lot's prayer. And Lot's prayer had almost as many words, but I'm not sure the Lord would recognize any of them. <laughs> Get your GD butts up here and let's say the GD Lord's Prayer. I mean, we got a GD game to play, so let's G let's get this GD thing going. It's like didn't quite know how to take that, but uh, you know, being from a Baptist background. You know, how many times have you, you had your kids walk up to you and they say, oh, no, 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 don't mess with daddy right now. That's the kind of attitude that you wanted to bring, and that's the kind of lifestyle that I wanted to lead. Everyone would say, Ronnie, how could you go off like that and then sit down and say, okay, let's pray? I'm almost positive that the Lord has forgiven me because he understands that there's only a couple ways to get people's attention. And sometimes you gotta go over the top. It's nothing but pure, pure love for the game of football. The transformation of wanting to be great, I wouldn't trade it for anything. They were 27th in defense in 1980, and they drafted those three starting defensive backs. They went up to second this year. Of course, they've also added Hacksaw Reynolds and Fred Dean. Fred Dean was acquired in October in a trade with San Diego. One of the first times I met Fred, he's laying on a bench in our weight room, smoking a cigarette. And I looked down, I said, Fred, what are you doing, man? He says, well, I was thinking about lifting weights, but I thought I might lie here till I got over it. <laughs> I remember one time I said something to him at a, at a function one day. And I said, hey, man, Fred, you know, we can't act like that. Fred said, what are you saying? I was like, no, I, I, I'm sorry, Mr. Dean. Because I, I, I knew that Fred would, if Fred could, if he wanted to, he could take me out. James Dean wasn't cooler than Fred Dean. Dean's first game as a 49er came in week six against Dallas. And not like he got there on Monday morning. He got there during the week, and we're getting ready to play Dallas. And it's like, well, what can he do for our defense against the Dallas Cowboys? He'll have to know our game plan. Well, you know, it's just like, <laughs> sick him. <laughs> There's our game plan. Fred, go get that guy. The whole offensive line of the Cowboys say, here he comes, here he comes. He runs a stunt. He runs over the guard. He breaks the center's leg. He sacks Danny White. He does it three or four times before halftime. We walk in the locker room. He pulls out a pack of cools. He starts smoking them. The whole team is over there 
Look at him. Bill Walsh is looking at him. Inspired by their new kid on the block, the 49ers exacted some revenge on an old bully and improved to 4-2. He's on his way to the 30, outrunning the defense. He'll go all the way. Touchdown for San Francisco's Dwight Clark. By our standards to that point, it was an ass-whipping of biblical proportions. We are putting it on the team in the NFL. We didn't beat him. We beat him up. Ronnie Lott intercepts. He's in for six points for San Francisco. Man, you can stick your chest out. You can feel good about yourself. And I don't know if anybody's ever had that with the San Francisco 49ers, especially against the Cowboys. After a big win like that against Dallas, you'd kind of expect to be on the Monday night halftime highlights. Buffalo seems to be achieving its purpose, but in a dubious way, Don. And for the first time in my six years, uh, we were going to see a 49er team humble the Dallas Cowboys. We were going to be the centerpiece and the highlight of the Monday night football highlights. And we were not. For us not to have you know, a moment, a second, not for Howard to say. And the tackling is brutal. No, not to have that. Come on. These that was probably, too, the birth of they don't respect us. And we were mad. And Bill knew it. And Bill took advantage of it. In recent years, a football team that plays in the city by the bay has been fogged in. But this year, the skies have brightened. The 49ers were becoming the surprise story of 1981. And at the halfway point of the season, they were 6-2. and two. And probably the most excited person in the whole deal was Bill Walsh. I think he thought this could be something special, turning from that bad to that good that fast. Running backs are Patton and Easley. The handoff given to Easley, cutting in, trying to get in. He is, and the 49ers have regained the lead here in Pittsburgh. Getting out of there with a win, that to me was the true turning point. In a crowd intercepted by Carlton Williamson. He's got the 30, the 35, the 40. All those great players. You tried not to be in awe of it, but it was the Pittsburgh Steelers, four-time world championship. We get back from kicking the Steelers' butts, and there's fans in the airport. You know, normally when we saw fans, it wasn't good. There were thousands of people at the airport kind of gives me chills a little bit. I mean, walking through there, I mean, that was the first validation from the fans that we're watching. You're doing this, and we appreciate it. Montana moving out to the right side, throws a pass, and it is caught by Young. Touchdown for San Francisco. I guess the way we knew that Bill Walsh would turn this thing around was he had this air about him. He had this uh, feeling of confidence. We are just better put together than the damn L.A. Rams. It's that simple. I know they all want to win badly. They want to beat us, but they can't do it because we play better as a unit than they do. Randy Cross, ready, snaps. Ball placed on, kicked on its way. It is good. Ray Wershing has kicked the field goal, and the 49ers have won it. They've beaten the Rams. The way he would motivate people, uh, either through fear or uh, he had this one little thing that he used to do that we found out later was all set up, but he would scream at the assistant coach, come down and get in the assistant coach's face and say, what the hell are you doing? You can't get this Clark kid to play any better than that. I'm getting rid of your butt. Get this guy playing better. I put the f play in, Paul. You correct me on the f field. I put the f thing in upstairs. Now I'm being told by you what the f to do. You just kind of listen to that stuff as you're going along, but you didn't know it was all set up until, you know, I, I got upstairs and heard, you know, oh, that was all fake. He was screaming at my coach, and it, and it was, he was told in the meeting before that he was going to get screamed at. That's, you know, that's, that's pretty smart, but uh, I can't believe I fell for it. He had that dry sense of humor that would come across in the meeting. You've got to have everybody 100% fresh for this ball game. Somehow you've got to be fresh. In some cases, it may mean a lot of sex. In others, none. I don't know. <laughs> I think it was easy to believe Bill Walsh because he would tell you things that would happen. All right, 
we're going to run this play against this defense. When you catch it, there won't be anybody within 10 yards of you. That would happen in the game, and you'd catch the ball and get ready to get hit and turn around, and there's nobody there. He would do those kind of things over and over with his designing of plays. Here he goes back to pass, looking down toward the end zone, open to Solomon. He's got it. No one was on Solomon. No one was within 10 yards of him. You just got to the point where everything he said, you just believe this is the way it's going to be. This is the way it's going to happen. So if it's not there, you just time to throw it. If I hadn't fouled, though, I had him. Sometimes football players have that stigma of the dumb football jock. But in Bill Walsh's offense, you couldn't be the dumb football jock. All I knew was a 10-yard hook was run 10 yards and hook. In the West Coast offense, a 10-yard hook could be a cross versus man-to-man. -man. If he has inside coverage, it's sliding back outside. If it's man-to-man -man under, you're looping out and around. And he got it for a touchdown for San Francisco. To me, that's what made uh, the West Coast offense really, really difficult. Having the ability to change routes, change the depth of your route, given the fact that a defense is running a certain defense, believe me, it is not fair. There were times that George Seifert and I, we would sit there and look at some of these patterns and we'd go, yeah, that, that, that's going to be hard to stop. Damn it, in 1981, football was smash mouth. Football was the, you know, the NFC East, and it was coming off the ball, and it was beating people up. And if you didn't do that, that wasn't really football. Suddenly, we were dancing and moving and jabbing and doing things people considered unmanly and not quite right. You know the quarterback's coming to here. You can Look at a chessboard, a conventional chessboard. Now take that same chessboard and a la Star Trek or Star Wars, where a chessboard now has four different tiers that's on a, like a diagonal like this, and you've got, you've got a board here, a board here, a board here, and a board here. We were playing the same game as everybody else. We were just playing on a couple different levels. We believed he knew something nobody else knew. We knew we had an advantage having him as our coach. The first time I met Joe Montana it was our first mini camp. I checked into the hotel and went over to the Howard Johnson's restaurant. This guy walks in, sits down at the other side of the counter. He got long blonde hair and he's got a Fu Manchu, just tiny little legs. Doesn't look very athletic at all. So I'm looking at him thinking, well, that might be a player, but uh, if it is, it's probably a kicker. When he walks on the field, it's like he puts the cape on and the S on the chest. You hear the analogy oh, all the time is given about a, you know, sort of a quiet killer, a quiet assassin. A lot like Clint Eastwood. Didn't have to say a lot. You know, he, you know, he, he just had that way about himself. Tell Freddie to split about. People naturally assume, and I think falsely, that Joe was just an extension of Bill. Joe had the ability to improvise. And I'm not sure if improvisation was something that Bill had initially built into his plan. But suddenly now he's with a guy that, from an improv standpoint, would be like comparing your average comedian to Robin Williams. Joe could riff on the football field amazingly. And he could take a lot of what Bill wanted to do and sort of put his own spin on it. Just as fine a pass as you're going to see, I'll tell you. He wasn't a great player at Notre Dame just uh, by passing through a town. Uh, his greatness shows up. It showed up there, and it showed up in, since he's probably first uh, put on a male supporter. Joe Montana received much of the credit for the 49ers' newfound success. And he accepted most of the blame when things went wrong. Fumbled snaps were always the quarterback's fault. If there was a bad snap, Bill or the offensive line coach would be quick to yell at the center, and Joe would immediately say, that was my fault. I pulled out too quick. Interceptions, bad throws, big hits, that was Joe's fault. And I think that's why all of his teammates loved him so much, supported him so much, and played their ass off for him. Clark outside on the left side, Sullivan inside. There goes Montana, draw through the middle, goes the quarterback. In week 13, the 49ers hosted the Giants 
A win would give San Francisco the NFC West title. He is in. It's a touchdown for Joe Montana. He goes back to throw a pass. Looking downfield, he's going to throw it deep. There are plenty of Niners around, and it is intercepted at the 50-yard line. Here it is. It's counted down. Carlton Williamson intercepts. It is all over. The 49ers have beaten the Giants. The 49ers have won the Western Division title. It was pretty awesome. Ronnie Lott's out there just basking in the wind like a rocker does when he jumps out into a crowd of people. For me, that was my teammate. They weren't carrying me off. I was part of them. They were part of us. One of the best moments of my life was when a lady came up to me. She said, you know what? I never watched football before, but the way you guys play, man, man, I, I have to watch it now. The regular season's over. We've got home field advantage. We've gone from 2-14 and 14 to 6-10 and 10 to suddenly 13-3. and three. And we're going to play the New York Giants. Montana ready first down. The ball is given to Rigdon. Rigdon plows his way toward the end zone. He's in. A 49er touchdown. And we win the game. We score 38 points. And, and we're going on to the NFC Championship game. Did it matter who was next? I'd say not really, but I'd be lying. We wanted the Cowboys, and we got them. Dallas Cowboys, America's team, Tom Landry, the darling of the NFL, their organization, too arrogant, arrogant, we're going to kill them, they pissed us off, they were to us everything and everybody that had just stomped on us for three or four years, we're going to kill the Cowboys, that's what, that's what was going on that week. <laughs> I was thinking about it. Uh, they say uh, Rose Bowl is the granddaddy of them all, but being here, it's overcoming that. It, this might be the great, great granddaddy right now. As I was going through that game, I did start to get the feel, wow, this is, this is awesome. You know, the back and forth of it. All the turnovers. We had six turnovers that game. You beat a team, but you still turn the ball over six times? That just doesn't happen. Just think of what that game's like if you take those six turnovers away. White going back to pass, throws it down the middle, and it is caught, and into the end zone for a touchdown is Cosby. Changing the upper hand on that scoreboard for the fifth time today. And they mark the ball down at the San Francisco 11. That's how far they have to go to win. At that time, Half the team had been sick and had the flu, and so we were all just exhausted and worn out. Dead tired. And I get into the, the huddle in the biggest drive of my life, and I'm throwing up in the huddle, which was nasty. The guys were saying, oh, get out of here. Yeah, and um, maybe it was some comic relief. I don't know. This feels impossible. America's team, 89 yards to win the game. I mean, this is when Dallas is great. But Joe comes in the huddle, just has that look on his face. Looks up and says, we're going to go down, we're going to score a touchdown, we're going to win this game, and we're going to stick it in their uh, ear. With the Cowboys expecting Montana to pass, Bill Walsh decided to play smash mouth football. The play calling on that whole drive was incredible. It was just the greatest chess match of all time. Look who's making the big plays. You know, Linville Elliott, former Cincinnati Bengal halfback, who was cut in the preseason and then resigned, is running left on 18 Bob. He's running right on 18 Bob. Unusual call, but effective. They're crossing up the Cowboys. We still got the feeling that, wow, we got them off balance. And then they were pursuing so hard, Bill comes up with the great call of the reverse. See reverse. And the running play. About the time that we thought we were going to run it, we would throw it. First down, he throws to the sideline, and it is caught by Clark at the 25. He goes out of bounds. A brilliant throw and catch. Oh, it's caught by Clark. 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 Oh, it's caught by Clark.
Lenville Elliott's final carry brought the ball to the six-yard line. The next play would mark the end of one dynasty and the birth of another. We're going to call a sprint option. He's going to break up and break into the corner. Okay, you got it? Dwight will clear. Dwight is in here sliding back out. This is great when they're tired and they're confused and they want to get back to Dallas. This is when you knock their ass off. If you don't get what you want, you'll just throw it, simply throw the ball away. Okay. Not there, away you go. You're ready to go to Dwight, got it? There wasn't a doubt in our mind that we were going to score on Dallas. They knew that they couldn't stop us. You only had to look across the line of scrimmage to know that. We had Joe. Who is this guy, Montana? I'm John Wayne. I'm John Wayne. And John Wayne never loses. I'm making this throw. So fasten your seatbelts now. We got turbulence and plenty of it here in Candlestick Park. How is this one going to end? goes back now to the improv, to what Joe brought to the offense. And it goes back to that chemistry of the two guys we thought were basketball players when they got there, Joe and Dwight, to what they could do together. I don't think Dwight had ever jumped that high before, and I know he hasn't jumped that high since. After Joe throws the ball, he, uh, he gets knocked to the ground, and he's laying there, and he hears the roar of the crowd. Too Tall Jones told Joe that, you know, you just beat America's team. And Joe said, well, you can sit at home with the rest of America and watch the Super Bowl. Now, that's pretty good. That's, that's pretty quick-witted for that moment. Joe had had some death threats that week. And as the clock's ticking down, you know, it's five, four, three, and, and we had the ball, so we had to kneel. He kneels down and just goes. He's got a security guard. And ran out of the end zone, because he didn't want to stand around because of the death threats. There were some people talking that that was a safety that would have given the Cowboys the win. That would have been interesting, but I... I think in, in the locker room, it seems like Joe hyperventilated or something. I mean, he, was, he was down for the count there for a little while. That was the beginning of being Joe Montana. It was the uh, abnormality of a once normal life from that point on. The 49ers, in one of the best drives in NFL history, scored with under a minute to go, and they beat the Dallas Cowboys 28 to 27, and now it's on to the Super Bowl for the Niners. Oh, Super Bowl! We talked about being champions from July 7th. We're champions right now. We got one more to go. Congratulations for a tremendous effort. Tremendous. I've been told that there was a uh, a poor Asian kid um, born on the January 10th, 1982, and his name is Dwight Clark Mitamuzo. So. I don't know if that's true, but for his sake, I hope not. But uh, that's, uh, that's quite an honor if it is true. It's humbling, really. I feel honored people are still talking about it 25 years later. It's called the Sprint Light Option. I'm honored to be able to be a part of a play that was kind of the culmination of just this incredible surprise season. It's great to give 49er fans that moment that they can relive over and over and over. And I know they do because when I'm in San Francisco or a lot of places, people want to talk about that play, how it crushed the Cowboys and sent them into submission for a decade. I never get tired of talking about it. I never get tired of seeing it. Because I, you know, sign pictures and send them to people, I see that catch every day. 
I may sit and think about that moment, you know, a couple times a year and, you know, how awesome it was to be a part of, to be a part of that play and, and be a part of the 49ers in, you know, the 80s. I mean, it, it, it's hard to get any better than that. There will never be Disneyland like that in my life again. It was a day I wish my son could have. Every sports fan or everybody that plays any sport could have. As long as we're alive, we'll always be a bond between all the guys that were involved. We look at each other to this day and just smile. To have been that bad, to have been laughed at that hard, and to come back and do that, that's like taking a guy and dropping him on Mount Everest. I mean, there's just some, not much oxygen left. For us, there wasn't much reality left. We had done something that no one else had ever done. We had gone from utter trash to, to suddenly, you know, we were that alchemist that figured out how do you turn, you know, the stuff in that trash can to gold? Well. From that day on, we were gold. We were told absolutely positively, do not go to the stadium early. And we went, uh-huh, okay. And about eight or nine of us got in cabs and went to the stadium early, and we missed the uh, Vice President Bush uh, traffic jam. But most of the team, including Bill Walsh and Joe Montana, was stuck in gridlock. For some reason, people weren't showing up, people who weren't there. And we were going, what the heck is going on? Joe had this music box, and he was playing This Is It. So they played that all the way there on the bus. This is it. They played it a couple times in the locker room and then turned it off. Bill came back through there and said to turn it back on. He, he wanted to hear it some more. I guess he thought it was sending the right message. This is it. This is it. Don't make any mistakes about it. It's it. It's the moment. To hear that song before that game, pregame speeches, Bill didn't give pregame speeches. That song said more than any pregame speech could ever say. This is a Super Bowl. I'm playing in the Super Bowl. It's 20 to nothing at the half. What I remember is making the mistake of thinking at halftime, this thing's kind of over. We're going to smoke these guys. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong. To me, the signature moment of that game was Dan Buns making that tackle. Late in the third quarter, Dan Buns made the pivotal play in the greatest goal line stand in Super Bowl history. Alexander does not get in. Dan Buns is the 49er who hit him at the half yard line. To be able to hit somebody that weighs 20 pounds heavier than you, to stone them. We all look for moments in sports where we feel that we own that moment. Danny Buns would always own the moment of one of the greatest plays in Super Bowl history. We got to go again, and that's what Forrest Gregg has already said. Go for it. You got to go for it. You got to go for it. From the two foot line, calling signals on fourth down, has the ball, has it off. He's been at the goal line. I don't believe he got in. I don't believe he's in there. The 49ers have held and listened to the Niners crowd across the way. Done it. We're world champions. I don't know if there'll ever be another team like that team. Why do I say that? Because Joe Montana wasn't Joe Montana. I wasn't Ronnie Lott. We didn't have what the Dallas Cowboys had. We didn't have any prime time players. Man, but what we had is we had heart, an insatiable heart of what it of what it what it takes to win. 49ers have won it. 
Bill Walsh and his staff and a team that confounded pro football observers throughout the year. There has to be a bond between the players and a coach, a personal close bond, and we had it with him. He was this professor, he was this genius, he was, you know, the, the stone-faced guy, but to us, he was a lot more than that. I mean, he was, a, he was a coach, he was a motivator, he was a friend. To see those guys pick him up and do that, there's nothing about that other than helping him enjoy what we've done. You're the world champ. You are. You are. You're the world champ. <laughs> Woo! Did you ever doubt it? No! <laughs> Everybody was ecstatic, and they were excited. And we were coming on the bus, and here was George Seifert. And I remember going, George, we did it. And George turns to me, and he goes, and now we get to do it again. There are a few moments in my life I'll, I'll always be in the moment. I'll be there when my kids were born. You know, I'll be there when a lot of tragic things have happened to our country and other, and other things in my life. But for me, I will always, you know, be in that season, in that moment. I say this today to all my friends. I say this today in the businesses that I'm associated with. Because of that moment, I will, I will always believe greatness comes from having people come together for a common cause. When I think about the 81 season, it's uh, being a kid playing in the street, saying uh, Joe Montana drops back and he hits Dwight Clark for a touchdown. And, you know, kids doing that and it coming to life. 81 was, was a dream that actually happened.